All right, you guys, let's start on uh, part two of this lecture. Okay, so hopefully the Nidarians part was okay, right? Let's just review Nidarians real quick. Um, okay, so what does the abral surface mean? What is it? Nobody knows where the abral surface means? Where just, the mouth is in. Yeah, it's where the mouth isn't, exactly, right? Because A means without and oral means mouth, right? So the abral surface is a part of the jellyfish that doesn't have its mouth. Okay, good. Um, what do you know about the abral surface for like a medusa? On top. It's on top and it's not attached to a substrate, right? Okay, so we can know medusa and polyp, right? And then what was the larval type before the polyp called? Planula, right? It's shaped like an ovary. Okay, and then um, what is uh, anthozoan? Sea anemone. Sea or uh, coral, right? How about a uh, regular jellyfish? Cyphozoa, right? Cyphozoa is the class. Okay? Alright, cool. So make sure you guys are studying that stuff at home and we get all that stuff down. For now, we are going to move on to the next group of organisms called mollusca, which may or may not be familiar. I mean, like snails, right? Um, there's a land snail. Okay, we've got some terrestrial representatives of mollusca. And we don't have any terrestrial representatives of Nigerians, actually. Right, but we do have one, a couple of mollusks. So, mollusks, right? Let's talk about these. These guys are soft bodied organisms, right? Just like how Nigerians were known as, you know, organisms with stinging cells, mollusca is known as soft bodied organisms, okay? So, soft bodied, mollusks, all mollusks have soft bodies, and we you know, if they have a soft body, they have to protect it. What do they use to protect it? A shell, right? So they all have a shell. Oh, no, okay, sorry, I was wrong. Most of them have a shell, right? Most of them have this hard exoskeleton, which is basically a shell. And what is it made out of? Calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, right? Seashell is probably the easiest example of what calcium carbonate is. You guys all have seen seashells before, have held seashells, right? Giant keyhole limpet, and this is a moon snail. So, I want you guys pass these around. Unfortunately, whoever owned these polished them, and now they feel all smooth, which is unnatural. But um, you guys can see what calcium carbonate is. The point is, it is hard, stiff, it is pretty dense. It's basically a rock at this point, right? Okay, so seashells. Seashells made of calcium carbonate, and the organs that live inside or that produce the shell is called a mollusk, right? So, how do they produce this? Well, they have a special organ in their body called a mantle, all right? The mantle is probably one of the most important organs, all right? As we go through mollusca, I'm gonna tell you guys right now that they have three essential organs or body parts that you guys will have to know. Four important ones, but three of them essential. And what I mean by that is, although I'm gonna teach you guys about four different body parts, three of them define mollusca. Like, only they have it, and nobody else has it, right? The other one, other organisms might have it, okay? So the mantle, the mantle is the first one, and what it does is it secretes, right? The word secretion means you emit a fluid, all right? It emits a fluid, and the fluid hardens into a shell. So it's kind of like cement. Does that make sense, right? Like, well, how does the cement start out? It's just like this fluid, right? But then it hardens into some rock, basically. Okay, so it secretes that thing, hardens into a shell, right? The shell ends up looking like this, right? Look at this, this is a clam, all right? This clam makes its shell with those cement secretions over time. It just keeps secreting a layer of that cement over the previous layer, and then you see how as the layers pile up, then it gets bigger, all right? When we call that accretion, right? When you keep piling on layer upon layer of new material, you accrete new material, right? Except in this case, the new material is coming from within, not from outside, all right? 
And the best way to think about this is, if you ever looked at the clam and noticed it had all these lines, that's not a design. That's a growth ring, right? Who else has growth rings? Trees. Trees, right? Trees have growth rings to tell you, you know, every year of its growth. But these are the same thing, right? So each of these rings, like, see this, this little part? That little mini clam on top of the big clam, right? That little mini clam is actually what it used to be at one point in time, all right? They start out right over here, okay? So if you can envision, this little part right here, this little clam, used to be this big, and then it would secrete a layer of calcium carbonate right along the edge. And once it secretes that layer, now it is this big. It secretes another layer, and now it is this big. Okay, see what's going on here? It keeps accreting layers, and the layers keep piling up, they keep accreting, until eventually maybe it's this big and then eventually maybe it is this big. You see that? It just keeps piling on layers and layers and it grows its shell in a very linear pattern like this, okay? Um, it's not as apparent, but just think about it a little bit and the same thing happens with a snail, see? So like, if you go look at the top of the snail, you see a mini snail right up here, right? This little mini snail keeps secreting layers on its shell like this, okay? and it just keeps going around like this. So looking at this now, the next layer it's gonna secrete is gonna be right here. You guys see that? And then the next layer after that is right here, and then right here, and then right here, until it makes another world. Okay, so it just keeps secreting layer upon layer of this calcium carbonate, and it hardens, and it just grows from this tiny little snail to this big snail. All right, so if you ever see a tiny snail, like a seashell, that's a tiny snail, then that means it died at that age, right? If you ever see a big one, then it used to be as small as the tip, and now it is this big, right? <clears throat> okay, so anyways, let's take a look at several different examples of shells. Here's an oyster, pismo clam, abalone, and a spider conch, right? What do you guys notice about all of these insides and how would you like to compare it to perhaps the outside of the shell? Smooth. Smooth where? On the inside, right? These are all glossy smooth. And maybe when you guys feel the shells that I'm passing around, it feels a little smooth on the inside. Why would it need to be smooth on the inside? Because it doesn't harm the organism. Yeah, it doesn't harm the organism. After all, it's a soft body animal. Right, mollusca, soft body organisms. Why would you want to live in a shell that's rough on the inside? That's abrasive. The outside doesn't really matter that much, right? So if you make the outside rough, it doesn't matter. But you live on the inside, right? And if this is supposed to be a suit of armor, would the suit of armor be any good if the spikes were facing inward? Not really, right? So you don't want you know the abrasive stuff to be on the inside. You want the inside to be comfortable, right? Like the helmets with the pads on the inside, right? You want the padding and the smoothness to be on the inside, and that way it actually protects the soft body of the animal, right? And so it does that by secreting a special type of calcium carbonate. The calcium carbonate on the inside versus the outside, the inside part is smooth because the special calcium carbonate, the nacre, right? That's what it secretes on the inside. It secretes a layer of nacre on the inside that makes it smooth and glossy, right? So it's called nacre, right? The outside is whatever, the inside is smooth, right? When I say whatever is like, sometimes it's smooth, sometimes it's rough, right? I say usually it is rough, but on occasion, you might get a shell that is smooth all the way around, all right? And so the example of that I'm talking about, um, what is it, is this, right? The cowrie, this is the chestnut cowrie. We have this in California, right? It is smooth all the way around, all right? Why is it smooth all the way around? Because, we go back to the previous slide, we'll see that the clam, the body of the clam, lives inside the shell, and what's the organ on the very edge? It's the mantle secreting the layer on the edge. All right, so with this in mind, we can kind of get the idea that any part of the shell that is in contact with the mantle is gonna be covered in nacre. Right, because that's what the mantle is doing. The mantle is constantly secreting the nacre around itself to protect.
protected from the abrasive shell. And so any part in contact with the mantle is pretty much going to be smooth, right? It'll be secreting the nacre. If the mantle is over here, then that area will be smooth because it'll be secreting the nacre. Okay, so this mantle part secreting the nacre right over here, making that part smooth and also making the shell bigger. If you guys look at the cowrie, look at the mantle of the cowrie. The mantle of the cowrie extends out and over the whole shell. And it basically even covers the outside of his shell with nacre. You guys see that? So then you get an entirely smooth shell like that. Yeah, but again, this is just a rare example, right? This is just an exception. Most of the organisms is only smooth on the inside, right? So I'll give you a good example of that, like this one right up here. That's not very smooth at all, right? That's an abalone. You guys know what the inside of abalone looks like? Smooth and colorful. Okay. Alright, right. you got a question over there? Yeah, okay. So, in, in this case, do you know how every shell is different, right? But mm -hmm. there's certain shells that have those spikes. Yeah. Is it because they produce more and it just doesn't cling on to the sides so it just keeps growing like that spikes? Oh, okay. So, you're talking like that spider con? Like this one? Yeah. Okay, so what this one did was. It just picks specific regions to add more. Oh. Yeah, just pick specific regions to add more calcium carbonate and just screw those out. Not completely sure why it does that. And honestly, shells like this kind of confuse me because I've I've never gotten to see what a young one looks like. I right. Know. Um, no, uh, what I mean is like you you probably have you know, an adult one, is what I'm saying. But I'm not com entirely convinced whether the young spider conch actually has these things, right? I think these things might only come when it's adults. Because when it's young, if you look at the other side of the shell, it doesn't have any smaller spikes throughout its history. Because you can look at its history by just looking at the rest of the shell, right? So I think that maybe once it becomes an adult, it just suddenly chooses random spots to tack on some more. Yeah, that's the best answer I can give you. I don't know. Do you think maybe they do it so it's like extra protection? Um, that's possible. Um, I know that like there are some snails that make appendages like that for extra protection. Yeah. Um, but let's see, what could it be for? Yeah, besides protection, I'm not completely sure. Yeah, but even if it were protection, this thing is huge already. It's like this big. So I don't really know why we need those spikes. Yeah, maybe sexual selection, but I doubt it because it's, it's pretty simple organism. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Why are spider con? You know, we should look that up. Yeah, I, I honestly don't even know. Okay. Why do spider con have? Spines are only found in adults. Oh, I was right about that. Uh, spines improve stability and prevents the shell snail from toppling over because it hops. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Okay, well, cool. Um, the snail hops. I mean, like, that's not too hard to understand because I mean, some sea slugs. They, they hop, they get off the ground and they swim around for a little bit. So it's not too hard to imagine a snail doing that as well. In fact, I have a video of a clam hopping. So um, seashells hopping around is not too hard. So like if it does hop around and if it ends up on its back, then that would be bad because the opening is on the top, right? And then some fish will just come over and eat it, right? But then if it has the spines preventing it from toppling over, that makes sense. So there we go. Right. <clears throat> okay, so we figured that out. Okay. Hopping snails. Okay, let's get back into this. So the abalone, right? The abalone clearly does not care about the outer surface of the shell. Its uh, mantle is not in contact with the outer surface of the shell, so therefore it becomes rough, right? And it becomes rough and hard like a rock. And whenever you get a 
big rocky surface that is slow, like an abalone, then other things will start to grow on top of it, like barnacles and polychaetes. Right? You guys remember polychaetes, the tube worms? Right? They might start burrowing and making their tubes on top of this snail shell. Right? So, okay, we got a bunch of. They're kind of like parasites at this point, right? We've got a bunch of these little parasites on top of the snail. But then the bad thing happens when, you know, the hitchhiking worms kind of try to take a little bit more than the apollonia would uh, like to give them, right? So what I mean by that is they start burrowing into the snail shell all the way until the meat, right? And that would be bad for the abalone, right? So if you guys flip it over, we'll see that these holes right here are attempts at worms to burrow inside, right? And every time the worm makes some headway and the abalone realizes, then the abalone is going to try to cover it up and repair the shell and prevent the worm access to the inside. You guys see that? So what does it do? It uses its mantle to secrete a layer of nacre over where the worm is trying to burrow. You see what's going on here? Like the worm keeps trying to make these holes. In this one, it tried really hard, apparently. And every time it tried to penetrate, the snail would cover it up with a layer of nacre. Right? Look at the color of this versus the color of that same material. Right? All that smooth nacre. Right? It has to do that because if it lets the worm get through, then well maybe the edges of the hole might be abrasive, or maybe the worm will start actually being a parasite. Who knows? Um, it opens it up to diseases, but the point is it wants to repair its shell with nacre and whenever it does that it, You just get this little smooth formation right over here, right? I show a normal shell here in contrast over there The only difference is these have repairs Repairs are all made of the same thing Nacre and a smooth calcium carbonate Right, the really crazy thing happens when it tries to repair, you know, how about not part of its shell, but something else that gets into its shell that begins to irritate it. All right. So like I'm talking about maybe like some sand or something. All right. Let's envision we got some sand that gets inside of the shell of, you know, a clam or something. And it's abrasive, right? It doesn't like it. It's not made of nacre. So what does it do? Well, it covers it with nacre. What happens when you cover the sand with nacre? Is it gonna be tolerable, right? It'll be okay. Because what do you know about nacre? It's smooth, right? So the nacre's all smooth, you, you know, and you kind of fix it, right? Now it's not a problem anymore. The sand particle that used to, you know, irritate the, the oyster or the clam, now is covered in nacre because nacre is smooth and once it does that it no longer irritates it okay so it covers it in nacre once it does that it just keeps adding layers to, and layers and layers to it as if it's growing its own shell right and eventually you get a sphere oh, what is that sphere it is a pearl right so now we know what a pearl is right a pearl is a glorified piece of sand right that is covered in calcium carbonate, right? But the special type of calcium carbonate, the smooth calcium carbonate called nacre, right? So if we take a close look at the pearl, right? Let's take a close look at the pearl, sorry. These pearls are made out of the same thing as the inside of the shell. You look at the color, you look at the sheen and the smoothness, it is the same thing, right? And so I'll show you guys those slides if you guys wanna read those, right? Any bit of irritating thing that gets inside of the shell, right, becomes covered in the nacre so it does not irritate the organism, right? Remember, mollusk means soft body and it does not like abrasive things, okay? So when abrasive things come in, it will smoothen it out by covering it with nacre, okay? Covers it with nacre, creates a little pearl, and there you go. It is no longer a problem because it's smooth now, so it's all good. Okay, so we got the pearl made out of the same thing as the shell, right? So pearl, you cut it open. It's just calcium carbonate, right? It's just nacre. You see how it's made of the same thing as the outside? This in glossy interior of seashells has 
kind of gained its own name, right? This being the pearl, this being what created the pearl, right? Kind of, we call it mother of pearl, right? The, all that smooth part on the inside of the shell. Mm -hmm. That's called mother of pearl, right? That's like the colloquial term for nacre, right? <clears throat> so that being said, the pearl is just a spherical seashell, right? Um, and so if you can make a shell, then you can make a pearl. Does that make sense? Because all a pearl is, is calcium carbonate layers over some sand. So as long as you're able to produce calcium carbonate layers, you can produce a pearl. Anything that makes a shell, you grow a shell by accretion, layers of calcium carbonate, you can make layers over some sand then. Right? Anything that can make a shell can make a pearl. So that's crazy because look, this is an oyster. We all know oysters create pearls. Right? But have we thought of snails making pearls before? Well, they can make a shell, can't they? And a shell is layers of calcium carbonate. So let me take a look at the queen conch, for example, making pearls. Now, does that make sense? Because look at these pearls. They're the same color and material as that because it's the same thing, nacre, right? Anything that makes a shell can make a pearl. And of course, I'm gonna have to include the abalone and the pearl that it makes too. Maybe not as pretty, they're not spherical, but those are pearls, right? A pearl is any like foreign piece of the nacre, right? So what was your question back there? So I'm gonna ask a stupid question, but okay. Um, is there ever like a moment where like one snail or, or cannot produce anymore, or do they continue producing? Like, oh, the shell, you mean? Or the um, nectar. So yeah, yeah, the shell, right? Yeah. So does it ever stop per, um, making the shell? Yeah. Yeah, there is a point. Um, so like, if you notice, like if you look at all the different types of shells there are, there's a maximum size to shells. So based off the maximum size, that's like the age where the organism usually stops doing that. Oh. All right. So yeah, there there is a time where it stops. Yeah, it doesn't work. Um, you can also change up the environmental conditions. So like, if you change up the environmental conditions, made it a little more acidic and more difficult to build a shell, then its maximum shell size might be smaller and thinner than, you know, normal. Right, okay, what's your question? Um, are the other pearls considered, like, valuable pearls? Like, are they considered like valuable? No, um, they're considered valuable to like a hobbyist like maybe like a diver or something, but they're probably not worth as much as a normal pearl is, right? Because you just gotta realize that currency is only valuable because we give it value. So if most people don't care about it, then it's not very valuable. So most people care about those pearls and they don't really care about these pearls. So even though these are rarer, those are probably worth more. Does that make sense? So um, if suddenly everybody cared about this, then it would be worth a lot. So you. That, that's more of like an economical question, right? Like things are only valuable when people care about it. Um, but uh, I'd say amongst divers though, abalone pearls are pretty sought after. <coughs> yeah, um, I know. Some people, you know, go, you know, shuck abalones just to look for pearls and stuff. So. But I don't know how much they actually cost. Yeah, we can look. I mean, we'll just see if eBay has any. Let's take abalone pearl. No, none of these are abalone pearls. Okay. Wait, how do you spell this? No, no, I keep doing this. Okay. Oh wait, what was that? No, I mean, uh, it's, it's All right, I don't know. I don't think uh, it's common right. enough. 
for me to find. But if I find one, I'll, I'll let you know how much it costs. Oh, this looks like an actual one. Six thousand. <laughs> but there's other stuff in here too, like diamond. Oh, here, this this is an authentic pearl, I think. Thirty bucks. One inch, two inches long. Thirty bucks. That's that's pretty reasonable. That's not like off the charts or anything. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yes, yeah, like they're not as pretty as those ones. So yeah, like you know, the whole only reason why pearls are expensive, you know, is they're shiny for one thing. Mm -hmm. But they're also spherical, all right? So if they're not spherical like these ones, then they would be tossed, right? So for example, you know, uh, I, did, I did actually answer this, right? Why are pearls so expensive? Because, you know, the, first of all, they're hand-picked, right? It was labor. But then also, um, if they're not completely spherical, then you have to toss them. And then, like, what's the likelihood it's perfectly spherical? Mm -hmm really unlikely, so that adds to the rare factor. And how many oysters do you have to kill to get a perfectly spherical um, pearl, right? So then depending on how much labor and stuff and oysters that cost, then it increases the price of rare pearls, right? <clears throat> okay, all right, so anyways, all good with the shell, right? The shell is made of calcium carbonate. The smooth part is called nacre. It's on the inside because the mantle wants to protect its body. Okay, so the next body part that we're going to cover is called the radula, all right, the radula, okay, that's a strange word, you've probably never heard of it, what kind of body part do you think it is, anybody have any guesses, like what do you think it's involved with at least, it's not making the shell because the mantle does that, so, what other activities are there, digestion, digestion? okay, you know, that's, that's good, right, eating, how about that, all right, yes, the radula is actually a feeding structure, on snails for the most part, right? It's a tongue. It's a tongue that is like a file, right? Uh, if you take a microscopic look, it has these little teeth on it. And if you imagine it's scraping upwards, it's kind of like a file, right? Okay, I don't know. When I saw this image, the first thing I saw were these middle teeth, which, I don't know, they kind of look like shark teeth in my opinion, right? I actually found a, a, this picture of a nurse shark tooth and it looks pretty similar for some reason, but Anyways, these, this tongue with these teeth on its tongue are used for scraping, all right? And they just like lick a rock, okay? And when you lick the rock, you can scrape the algae off of the rock with your sharp tongue, right? Um, cats have a sharp tongue too, right? So it's kind of similar, right? They use their tongue to scrape the, the fur off of their body, right? But in this case, they're scraping the algae off of the rock, right, with their abrasive tongue. Okay, we can watch this in action right over here. Let's pay attention to this snail. So this snail is on, it's clinging to the glass of an aquarium. And you know, that's why they're popular for aquariums, right? Because they clean the glass for you, okay? Right, so let's watch it. Okay, so you see the little thing coming in and out? That thing is the radula scraping downward and trying to scrape the algae off of the glass. There we go. Okay, so the radula, right? The radula is a feeding structure. More appropriately, it's a tongue that scrapes the algae off of a rock. Okay, now let's think about that for a second. Algae macroalgae, grows on the rock. You are walking around on the rock, scraping the algae off the rock. Do you have to expend a lot of energy to do this? No, right? Um, is the algae gonna get away from you? No. So, do you see how like, if you're targeting something like algae, you could just walk around at your own pace and just pick it up, right? You don't have to chase after it, you can afford to go slow, right? So the certain type of feeding uh, style 
and it's associated with walking around slowly, picking up food at your leisure because your food is not going to get away from you, is called grazing. All right? There you go. Grazing. Okay? Grazing is just when you walk around slowly and you just pick up the food. All right? Does anybody else know what other animal does grazing? Cattle. 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 Of course. Right? Everybody knows that cows graze. What are they doing? They're walking around slowly, eating grass, just picking it up. Why, can, why are they walking around so slowly? Because the grass is not going to get away from them. Right? Um, this is not to say that it has to be a plant. Right? In the case of the cattle, in the case of the snail, yeah, it's a plant. Okay. But it doesn't have to be a plant. Anything that is significantly slower than you, even if it's an animal, also counts. Because as long as you don't have to chase after it, then it counts as grazing. Okay, so an example for that would be ladybugs. Right? What do ladybugs eat? Aphids, aphids. right? You guys know what an aphid is? It's a, it's a tiny green bug, right? Okay, they're like less than a millimeter, right? So if an aphid is this big, then the ladybug is like, this big, right? Here the ladybug is like this big. And if you get the ladybug and, you know, compared to the ladybug, the aphid is so slow, it cannot outrun it no matter what it is doing. So the ladybug is just going to walk around and slurp them up, right? This is considered grazing as well, okay? So anything that either doesn't move or is significantly slower than you, if you can just walk around leisurely and pick it up, then the feeding style is called grazing. Okay, and that's what snails do, right? Snails are grazing. Okay, grazing. Okay, any question on the feeding style? Right, the feeding style is going to be different depending on which mollusk we're talking about. Okay, so for snails, it is grazing, but for clams, as we're going to learn later, it's something else, right? We'll get to that eventually. Probably tomorrow. Okay, so last body part oops, is called the foot. Okay, it's not too complicated to think what the foot is used for. Right, getting around maybe. Okay, we we say locomotion. That is the word for getting around. Right, getting from point A to point B. That's probably what the foot is for, but it has a lot of other uses as well. So let's take a look. The foot. Right, snails and the rest of the mollusks have one foot. Right, you guys have two, but the snails, right? They all have one, a single muscular foot, right? Now, how do you use that one foot? We actually saw that snail in the previous video with a big foot, right? That foot was the big white circle next to its radula, right? Okay, so that thing, right? That was the foot, whereas the radula was the mouth part right there. That one foot, what was it doing with that one foot? It was uh, sticking, sticking to the to glass, it. right? The foot of a snail allows suction, right? So it can walk up walls, cling onto surfaces, right? But not only that, crawling around, right? Maybe not as very fast, but it can hold on to things, right? It can cling onto surfaces. That's what a snail's foot is used for. Getting around and holding on to things. Okay. Let's look at a clam, right? If you like to eat a clam, you do a little dissection next time you eat it, right? Um, here's its foot right over here. What's this thing? Right. That's the mantle, actually. Yeah, good guess, though. It's not the radula, right? But this is the, the mantle. But here we have the foot, right? The foot. When the clam is alive, here's one usage of the foot, right? Digging. Let's look how this works. The clam is here at the surface, it thrusts its foot down into the sand. Right, the way it does that is its foot has like fluid in it and it can choose to move the fluid around its foot at will. Okay, so it changes the shape of the foot by moving the fluid around it. Okay, just think of like a, a water balloon and you know how the water balloon is like kind of squishy and if you move the fluid to one side it will cause that part to bulge up and move to the other side it will cause that part to bulge up. Right, so over here it extends the foot deep into the sand and then it swells up the end of it by moving water from here to the end, right? So it swells up the end, and then it creates like an anchor, right? Once it creates this anchor deep down here, 
then it's, all it has to do is contract its foot, and a contraction means it shortens the muscle. So when it contracts its foot, and this part stays in place, then what's going to happen to the whole clam? The whole clam ends up going down, right? Into the sand. So you see the clam can dig that way, right? It digs by extending its foot, anchoring that foot, pulling its body towards that foot, and then re extending, anchoring, and pulling its body towards the anchor. Okay? Alright, so one use of clams is digging. Okay, let's continue on. Let's look at this video clip of an abalone trying to escape a sea star. So this is a really unique usage of the foot, right? So what can you do with that foot? You can hold it onto the place or you can crawl forward, right? In this case, at one point, you could see that the sea star had like all of its arms on top of the whole shell, right? It was all the way on top. And how would you get away? Would you attempt to just like crawl away and just like pull yourself off? Or instead, it stays in place and it twists itself loose, right? How does it twist itself loose? The cool thing is, it, the, the narrator said, the foot was attached to the shell. And so, just as you can, you know, drag the shell along, you can also swing the shell around. So it swings the shell, and by doing that, it, you know, breaks free of all those suction the two feet. Right. So it's pretty cool, right? It can twist its shell to get away from that's one way to get away from the sea star. Let's watch another organism get away from that sea star. Right? So here's a clam, a cockle. Right? Getting away from the same sea star, right? The sunflower star. So that was the video of the hopping clam that I was telling you guys about, right? So, I mean, if you imagine like a snail extending its foot like that, it's not too hard to imagine that it could hop around, right? I mean, like, things are lighter in water, so, I mean, it's not, you know, that big of a deal to think of a snail hopping. On land, yeah, that sounds crazy, but in the water, it's, it's not that big of a deal, actually. Um, did you guys see when the clam was going around, it was like the shell was just like toppling all around right so that's where the spikes come in right the spikes on the spider conch prevent it from rolling around like that whereas you know this cockle was round so it just kept rolling around and tumbling okay all right so any questions on foot everybody got it for the most part it's a form of locomotion um, but for snails they can use it to hold on to surfaces as well strong suction. <clears throat> okay. So where are we at right now? What do we here? Oh, perfect. Still early. Yes. Okay. Let's just continue. Okay. So any questions on mollusks so far? 
Are we all good with mollusks? What are the three essential body parts of a mollusk? Mantle, radula, and a foot. Okay, so we know what foot does. What does radula do? It scrapes algae off rocks, right? It's for eating. And what does the mantle do? It's basically the organ that builds its shell, right? So it builds its shell using the mantle. And what is the texture of the shell when the mantle secretes it? I would say soft. Smooth, right? Smooth is better. Because soft implies that you can depress into it, right? Smooth, right? Smooth. And what was it? Smooth calcium carbonate called? Nacre. It was called nacre, right? And it's usually on the inside or wherever it is in contact with the mantle. Okay, good. So I think we're pretty good on this. So let's uh, move on with our lecture. We'll, we have a couple other things to cover, right? If you look down your checklist of things to look for, um, we have yet to go over larval type. We haven't talked about symmetry, and we also have to talk about classes, right? So we'll kind of cover those things. I don't think we might even be able to finish it today. Okay, so let's go over the first class of mollusks that we're going to go over. Class gastropoda, right? Gastropoda. Gastro, I guess that means like a stomach, right? Like gastric, and poda means foot, right? So gastropod, right? These are your snails, okay? So we got our normal snails here, but we also got Unique snails, like a more flattened snail, like an abalone, and one that is so flat they don't even have a spiral to it, a limpet, all right? Mm -hmm. So that's a word that I actually want you guys to know, a limpet, right? If you see a cone-shaped snail, right? On the side, if you look at a limpet on the side, here's the cone-shaped shell. The bottom of it just looks like a regular snail, right? I mean, it just doesn't have a, a spiral to it. I mean, you could draw a normal snail right here, the difference is that, all right, that's the shape of the shell, but it's a snail, right? So a limpet, a flat cone-shaped snail, um, they're cone-shaped, we'll talk about it later, but those are a little adaptation for in your title way. And then we have shellless representatives. So you can have mollusks that don't build a shell, right? So what are sea slugs? Right, sea slugs are basically snails that do not have a shell, and we call sea slugs nudibranchs. you're talking about. You're, I think you're talking about a cone snail. Maybe. I saw yeah. like a DC doctor. There's like this, uh, two types of sea slugs that they just go around the floor and then they shoot to hop into the nearest uh, fish or... Okay, okay. Um, I don't know examples of sea slugs that do it, but I don't doubt that there are. There might be some. Um, but I do know that there's a snail that does that. Right? It's called the cone snail and it sh does shoot out this toxin into a fish. Right, and the thing that it uses to shoot the toxin out is its radula. Oh. Yeah, so you're right about that. It's a modified radula. So most radula are used to scrape algae off rocks, but sometimes you can modify the radula to do other things. Right, so in that case, shooting a harpoon with venom inside. Right. Yeah. So I'll have to look that up later if there are sea slugs that do that, but I, I know that the cone cell does that. Right. We'll watch a clip on that later. Okay, so gastropods, right? That's your snail. Okay, so now we know what class snails are in. Gastropoda. Okay, let's take a look at these, right? This is a baby snail. When you look at the baby snail, it look, it already has a little shell. Do you see it? The shell is already starting to grow right here. And then you have this. What body part do you think this is? That's the foot. Yeah, it, it looks like multiple appendages right now, but later on, it'll all coalesce into the single foot, right? So this, the baby snail, 
the larval snail we call veliger. All right, so veliger larvae, that's what mollusks have. Okay, so we call the snail larvae veligers, and we usually call like clam and oyster larvae veligers as well. And now we have it, larval type of a mollusk, the veliger. <coughs> Okay, so as you guys can see, the villager larvae already has a semblance of the shell. <clears throat> okay, continue on. So, I just want to compare real quick a shell gastropod versus a non-shell gastropod, right? So, this one on top is a triton conch, right? A um, big snail with a shell, but this this is a snail without a shell. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Not every mollusk produces a shell, right? So you should just get used to the fact that just because the mollusk doesn't mean it produces a shell, there may be shellless representatives. And in the case of gastropoda, it is nudibranchs, right? Um, yeah, it is nudibranchs. Mollusk has a shell. Okay. Um, continue on. Gastropods. What they use their foot primarily for is suction, right? Clams, yes, they have a foot, but they don't cling onto sides like a snail does, right? So you guys see like maybe a Chinese restaurant, and you got all these abalones clinging onto the side, right? With their foot. And here's some garden snails clinging onto the side of the wall with their foot. Right? Their one muscular foot is shaped in a way that provides powerful suction against the hard surface. Here's some body parts, right? Okay, so body parts of the snail, we've got these tall eyes. Now, scientifically, we would call these eye stalks, right? An eye stalk is not really like an eye, it's more like a structure that holds the eye, okay? The eye is that little part on the tip, and this right here is what holds it, right? The eye stalk. Okay, so any organism that has an eye on the tip of the long appendage, if you want to call it that, is, is called an eye stalk, right? So eye stalks, you know the name of that thing now. Okay, so we've seen shellless representatives of gastropods. The gastropod foot is provides very good suction, and gastropods have eye stalks. Right. Last, um, their radula is used for scraping. Right. So the reason why I'm mentioning this here is only the snail's radula does scraping. Right. The other mollusks either don't have a radula or they use a radula for a different purpose. So for a snail, they're the only ones with the actual file-like tongue to do the scraping. And what are they scraping? Algae, so mostly herbivorous. But when I say mostly, it means that some of them don't eat, uh, they, some of them don't eat algae, and right? some of them eat other things. So for example, like an oyster drill, right? Have you guys heard of oyster drill before? Right? It's a type of snail that drills its way into an oyster, right? How does it drill its way into the oyster? It uses its radula to scrape at the oyster shell until it gets on the inside. Right. So that's one way of scraping something that's not algae. But there's other times when we have snails that try to eat fish, right? And then we'll see how they try to do that. Right. Let's take a look at this. See this? This is called a cone snail, right? And a cone snail with its modified radula like this shoots it out and catches fish. Is this what you were referring to? Or was it actually a slug? It was actually a slug. It was like a pink and white slug. Mm -hmm. And it was like probably on the floor, and it just like a little fish came by and it just harpooned it. Okay. And the fish started shaking. All right, wow. Okay, so it's probably the same mechanism, but uh, I guess slugs do it too. I have to look that up later. Thanks. Okay. 
Okay, so let's watch a little quick little video clip of these cone snails eating fish. It's armed with at least a hundred different toxins, more than any other creature. Some cone snails go hunting. They like to burrow into the sand and wait. When a meal happens by, the cone snail fires its harpoon. What's it using to dig? It's what? It's quickly paralyze the fish. <clears throat> Once its prey is helpless, the cone snail retracts it through its proboscis until it engulfs the fish, swallowing it. So, cone snails, right? Well, a really venomous snail that shoots its, they call it a proboscis, but what it really is, it's a modified radula, right? And they shoot it at a fish, and it paralyzes the fish. It needs to be toxic so that the fish dies before it can swim away, right? Because the snail is too slow to chase after it, right? Just a guess, where do you think the toxic cone snails are found? In Australia. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be a couple elsewhere too, as well, but the really toxic ones are found in Australia as well. Okay. Have there ever been cases where uh, deep water is swimming in it? Yes. So, shell collectors, tropical shell collectors, mishandle, you know, cone snails and they get stung and die. Yeah. <clears throat> So modified radula, they call it a proboscis, but it's okay. Um, it's fine. It's just a radula, right? <clears throat> okay. And then the last body part that some uh, gastropods have are tentacles, right? Now we're gonna see another class of mollusks that are very famous for their tentacles, but. You know, like, we, we shouldn't think of those guys as odd one out. It's like, oh yeah, that class has tentacles and the other ones don't. No, that's, that's wrong. Actually, every class of mollusks has tentacles, even snails, right? So if you guys look, these things, I mean, what else are those? They're tentacles, right? So up besides the mantle that you see underneath, we got all these appendages right here for feeling, right? Those are tentacles. Not every snail has them, but many of them do. The snails have tentacles. <clears throat> yes? Is it the whole of them from one? Oh, these holes? Actually, no. Um, this uh, type of snail actually has holes there for breathing. Oh. Yeah, so those are its own holes, right? But if 
you know, some worm came along over here and created some holes. And it's, but yeah, good observation there. So these holes are actually its own holes. Okay, let's move on to the next class of mollusks. All right, class bivalvia. This is probably the easiest one to remember because, well, valve means, you know, I guess in this case it means shell, right? But it really means open. But bi means two. So which ones have two shells? Well, plants have two shells, right? So if you think of, you know, the ones that have like a left and right shell that are perfectly able to mirror each other, Right, that's the bivalve. So that said, clams, what else? What else is a bivalve? Mussels. mussels, okay. Do you have any other examples? Oysters. Oysters, yeah, clams, mussels, oysters, right? These things have two shells, so here's some other examples that have. All right, mussels, oysters, scallop, right? There you go. Things have two shells, mirror image shells, and we call them bivalve. <clears throat> okay, so the thing about bivalves is now that we know that these guys have two shells and we can open up like this, the symmetry becomes really, really obvious, right? So, what would you guys say? Bilateral, right? Cut it right down here and the bivalve gives away its own symmetry. It's bilateral, right? So, mollusks are bilaterally symmetric. Now, that's all good and stuff, but that kind of calls into question a little bit snails because the snail shell is not bilaterally symmetric. See what I'm saying, right? It's, it's actually um, rotationally symmetric, right? So that one's slightly different, but you don't want to consider the shell a part of its body, right? That exoskeleton is just, you know, this inorganic substance that it created, that it wears on its back, but it's not part of its actual body, right? If you took the shell off, right? If you took the shell off of a snail, right? What do you get? A slug, right? Let's look at a slug from the top view. that's bilateral right so you can put a shell here but you know the shell itself is not you know bilaterally symmetric but the body is right the body is bilaterally symmetric as we expect one line of symmetry down the middle. Okay. what are these called again ice stocks yes. okay, good so bilaterally symmetric are you okay with all this right okay bilateral symmetry right um in contrast to the clams, we can see these guys, these cone-shaped ones, um, these are probably more obvious than snails at being bilateral. Right? What were these called again? Do you guys remember? Limpets. Limpets, right? The little cone-shaped snails. And if you were to draw lines of symmetry on these guys, you could draw it right down this little slime that they have. Right? Lines of symmetry. <clears throat> okay, so Anybody here like to eat mussels? A couple of you guys, right? Even if you don't like to eat them, who has eaten mussels before? A couple of you guys, right? When you eat the mussel, you take the mussel from the shell. Isn't there always that one little annoying piece of meat that gets stuck to the shell? You can't get off, right? That little piece right there, see that? All right, what is that? That's a special mussel, right? That is called the adductor muscle, right? It's a really strong muscle that holds its shell closed, right? So here's the thing about bivalves, right? A bivalve has a two-sided shell, and the two-sided shell is connected by a protein, right? A kind of elastic protein. And then that elastic protein is like a spring. It spring loads the shell to be open at all times, all right? So every bivalve has a spring-loaded mechanism to open its shell up. So while the muscle or the clam is alive, it is constantly contracting its adductor muscle to keep it closed. 
Does that make sense? So if it wants to open its shell to get water, it'll relax its adductor muscle. If it wants to close its shell for protection or something, it will contract its adductor muscle. Okay. So while it's alive, its shell is closed, contracted adductor muscle. You cook your muscle, you kill it, and what happens? What happens when you cook your muscle relaxation? It well, it becomes non-functional, and then what happens to the shell? It opens up, right? So now we know, right? Um, when you kill the muscle, it opens up its shell because its adductor muscle is no longer contracting. <clears throat> okay, so the adductor muscle. Usually whenever I eat muscles, I take a spoon and I try to scrape it off. <clears throat> okay, so when you compare different types of bivalves, we see that all the other ones have the adductor muscle as well. For clams, they have two, one on each side, these circular things. Okay, here's one on this side and there's one on the other side. Circular muscles. And for a scallop, the main part that you eat is the adductor muscle, right? And that part keeps its shell closed, right? Or it can open and close its shell really fast and sometimes it can swim around like that. Okay, so abductor muscle. All right, I think we just have enough time to talk about the last class, right? Let's see. Let's see, how many slides did I put? Nope, not going to finish, so. Yeah, let's just introduce this one. Let's get down to this one right here. One for people. Okay, yeah, let's just make sure we cover every single cephalopod. Alright. Last class, right? There are more than three classes of mollusks, but we're only going to talk about these three classes. Right. So the third class we're going to talk about is cephalopoda. Cephalo means head, poda means foot, so its head is right next to its foot. Oh, where's its foot? Turns out its foot is all these, right? All these, its eight arms is its modified foot, right? Its foot has been modified into all these arms, right? Okay, so this head, right, that's its mantle. What's different about the octopus mantle from a normal mantle? This mantle does not make a shell. Make a shell, yeah. So, okay, an octopus is a shell this mollusk, right? And then its foot has been modified into eight arms, right? And then here I put a little disambiguation. These are not called tentacles, they're called arms, right? Now that's kind of strange. What's the difference? An arm is muscular and it manipulates things usually. Whereas a tentacle, it's kind of just like whips around and feels things, right? That's kind of like a difference. <clears throat> they do look like tentacles, but since they can be used to manipulate the environment, right, we usually call them arms instead. Okay, so it's got a mantle and its foot. What are we missing here? The radula, right? Okay, the radula. Where is its radula? The beak is under. The beak. Yeah, exactly. So you know what the octopus mouth looks like, right? It looks like a beak, right? Here it is. The beak. Okay, this is its radula. The octopus's radula is, has been modified into a beak, all right? So you know what beaks, you know, they're, they're hard, they're strong, they crush. So what kind of food is it going to be going after? Exoskeletons, um, sea creatures? Yeah, okay. Hard shelled animals. Does that make sense, right? So we'll probably go after something hard, right? What's hard? Crab. Crab, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, well, I mean, I guess I said so right here, but, you know, things with exoskeletons, things that are hard, it uses the beak to crack them open and it paralyzes them with venom, right? <clears throat> little clip on the radula sort of. Let me just show you octopus eating. Thank you. 
and sucks out the liquefying flesh, leaving behind a perfectly clean plate. Octopuses will eat almost anything, and they eat a lot. Every day, an octopus gains up to 2% of its body weight, the equivalent of a human gaining 4 pounds a day. We saw the octopus use its radula. It doesn't use it to scrape things, right? Instead, it uses it to crush hard shell things like crabs. Okay, so here's some examples of cephalopods, right? Besides octopus, we have all of their octopus relatives, right? Like this, the squid, and that's called a cuttlefish. And this, this is actually the a shell representative, right? It actually has a shell called the nautilus. <coughs> Okay, so there's some examples of several parts. Okay, so I just want to talk about cephalopod shells real quick before we finish, right? The octopus out of those four is actually the odd one out, okay? And the reason why is the octopus is the only one that doesn't have a shell. I know how that sounds. It, like, the only one that looked like it had a shell was a nautilus, but trust me, the other ones have a shell, right? You just can't see it. The octopus is the only one that truly does not have a shell, right? A shell is representative of not only a cephalopod, but a shellless mollusk as well. But then again, shelllessness of mollusks, although rare, is not, you know, unheard of, right? When was the last time we saw a shellless mollusk? Slug. Slug, right? The nudibranch, right? The nudibranch is like a gastropod that doesn't have a shell, right? So, you know, we're fine with this being shellless, so, you know, octopus being shellless is okay as well. So let's talk about the ones that do have a shell, right? All these other ones have a shell. Obviously, this one has a shell. It kind of looks like a snail, right? Well, what about these guys? Where are their shells? You guys see the shell? No, right? Okay. So let's take a look. The Nautilus first has the obvious shell, right? Okay. That shell on the back looks like a snail shell, right? Um, if you guys cut it open, right, it looks like this with all these chambers, right? These chambers are closed off and full of air, all right? So that actually enables it to float because, like, if you think about it, a snail floating around sounds improbable because a snail shell is heavy. But this is not a normal snail shell. This spiral shell actually has these closed off chambers that are full of air, right? And then only the end of it is open. This is where it lives. These parts are full of air, so it actually floats around with these air pockets, right? What's another man-made object that floats around under the sea with air? Submarines. submarines, right? They go up and down by releasing air inside of the whole submarine, right? So look at the name we call this, the Nautilus, right? You know why we call it this? Because the Nautilus is the name of a famous submarine. You guys know which submarine I'm talking about? <coughs> yeah, 20,000 leagues, and who is the captain? Nemo. Nemo, yeah, exactly. All right, so Captain Nemo, right, the clownfish, um, was the captain of uh, the Nautilus, right, which was a submarine. So then now we have this submarine-like organism we call the Nautilus, right? Okay, but let's talk about the other two real quick. The cuttlefish and the squid. Right off the bat, you don't see a shell. You feel it and it's all soft, right? It's a soft body organism. No shell. Where is its shell? Well, if you look at the big mantle right over here, there's got to be something keeping the shape of the mantle and that's going to be an internal shell, all right? So in these cases, right, the cuddle bone of a cuttlefish and the pen of the squid is what is used underneath to hold it in its structure, right? So this shape is held by these internal shells, right? So yeah, I guess you can kind of call it like a bone because it's like an internal skeleton, but it really is just a shell because it's one is made of calcium carbonate 
And two, look what cre what created it. What body part created it? It's obvious because it's literally right underneath the mantle, right? See, these were created with the mantle, just like all the other shells were, right? Just like all the other mollusk shells. Okay, so it turns out we have one normal shell, the Nautilus. We have two internal shells, and we have one representative who is entirely shellless, an octopus. Right? Okay, so. How are we feeling on cephalopods? Doing okay? Everybody know everything about cephalopods? No, we didn't talk much about cephalopods. Um, how are we feeling on mollusks in general? Doing okay? <coughs> Let me see if my email came in. Let's see. Did it come in yet? Oh no. Still didn't come in yet. Okay, I guess I'll have to show you tomorrow. Alright you guys, so this is going to be the end of our lecture for today. Uh, we have a little bit left of mollusca to talk about before we can go on to the next right. trial. Um, everyone else doing all right? Okay. Okay, cool. So let's get into this. Let's finish our lecture from the other day. The mollusks, right? Okay, so let's just do a quick recap to catch us up to the present slide right here. Okay, so mollusca, right? A mollusk is a phylum of organisms that are known for what? What do they all have? They got soft bodies, right? And then most of them, in order to protect their soft bodies, make what? Shell. Oh. Shell. You're on the right track. Okay, what do they use to protect their soft bodies? The shell, right? Okay, so they make a shell. The shell is made out of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate and it is made by the organ, the mantle. Okay, good. So remember, the mantle is one of the three essential body parts of the mollusk, in addition to... Awesome. The radula, which is a feeding structure, and the foot, which is used for, like for snails, used for suction, right, and for like other organs like clams, it's for moving around, such as digging, or you saw that one clam pushing itself away from the sea star, right, okay, so locomotion, okay, so central body parts, and then, what else are we talking, we talked about its uh, larval type, right, who remembers the larval type? And it actually starts with a V. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, what was that? Uh, yeah, okay, Veliger, right? Does that sound familiar? Maybe. Okay, we just learned it yesterday, so you guys have like a whole week to get this down. So Veliger, right? The Veliger larva, right? And then it turns into the adult. Okay, good. So um, the feeding style is largely dependent on what class we're in, so we didn't really talk too much about that, but we did talk about for snails at least, right? Snails, gastropods, what is their feeding style? Grazing. Grazing, right? And what does that mean? Not having to chase your food. Yeah, not having to chase your food, and you just pick it up from the ground slowly, right? Okay, that's what grazing means. But as we're going to see today, there's other feeding styles employed by the other classes which we kind of got into, right? So the first class, gastropoda, includes snails and what else? Limpids. Limpids and abalone. abalone. How about the ones with no shell? Nudibranchs. Nudibranchs, right? Okay, good. So we got those. What is the difference between a gastropod and a bivalve? Um, the bivalve has two shells. Yeah, the bivalve has two shells, exactly, right? It's connected by that one spring-loaded protein. Right, and then what do they use to keep that shell closed? Yeah, the adductor muscle. You guys remember that? Okay, good, so we got this, right? Okay, the adductor muscle, and then uh, because it has two shells and opens up wide like this, it's easy to tell its symmetry, which is bilateral, right? Okay, so then we get on to the last group, which, you know, the, um, like octopus, right? The one that looks like the odd one out of the whole thing, which it kind of is, right? It doesn't have a shell. It's got arms for some reason, but we learned that its head is called the mantle, and the eight arms is actually its one foot, right? It's just been modified into the eight arms, and its radula is its beak, right? So that's for an octopus. 
But the octopus is not the only cephalopod out there. We also have squid, cuttlefish, and what was the fourth one? The nautilus, right? What was special about the nautilus compared to the other three? And yeah, it's got an external shell, right? A shell on the outside, it kind of looks like a snail shell, but not quite, right? And then it floats around in it, right? Okay, and then we, the last thing we talked about was the fact that squid and cuttlefish, although they don't look like they have shells, actually do because it's on the inside of the body, right? They got an internal shell, which is, again, made by their mantle. Okay, any questions? Does some fall familiar to you guys? Yeah, maybe. Okay, so let's just continue this lecture and finish this off. All right, so the um, next thing we're going to talk about is the fact that octopus and squid, right, they both have a bunch of, you know, little appendages, but what is the proper name for those appendages? Well, an octopus has eight something. We'll get into that. But the squid has ten appendages, right? It turns out that these eight short ones are called arms, all right? Arms are used to manipulate the environment. They have a lot of control over them, right? Um, but tentacles, right, these long, these two long ones are tentacles. Um, you see that they only have suckers on the end of them. And they're used for grabbing things or feeling things, right? So it's a little bit different between the two, right? These things can manipulate things. These just grab or feel around, okay? That's usually what tentacles are for. <clears throat> Okay, so when we look at an octopus instead, an octopus with its eight appendages, it does not have these two long tentacles. So if that were the case, then what would you call the eight appendages it has? They would be arms, right? It does not have the two tentacles. The octopus, right? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's, let's skip ahead. Um, the octopus has eight arms, right? Okay, so it, again, it uses its arms to manipulate the environment it doesn't have the tentacles that, you know, does that grabbing thing or the, or the feeling thing. And what I mean by the grabbing thing is, it's best if I just show you this one video right over here that explains it pretty well. It explains the feeding style of a squid at the same time. So we'll see how a squid uses its tentacles to feed, right? Okay, let's watch this squid. The diver took this video of a squid underwater and it's hunting, right? So let's watch. Okay, right here, pay attention. Okay, it's kind of dim, but let's just see that again. Right here are its arms. Opens up its arms, and then what happens? It grabs with what? Its tentacles. Do you see how those two tentacles shot out from the inside? Right, let's watch that again if you didn't realize. So here's its arms, and the tentacles are folded inside, right? open the arms and then the tentacles shoot out and grab whatever is right there and then it withdraws it back towards its beak right so it eats it okay so did you guys see that it just like shot out and grabbed its prey with two tentacles so what would you like to call that feeding style when it grabbed it like that raptorial, raptorial feeding right it's not a claw but look you're using like a two-sided thing to grab onto its prey that's how it got it so there you go. The feeding style of a squid is sometimes considered raptorial feeding. All right. And when I say sometimes, it's because yeah, I can show you another video clip. It's it's pretty cool. It's not raptorial feeding. I just want to throw this in there because I don't know. I think it's kind of funny. Okay. So here's a long line with uh, with some bait on it, and the squid took the bait, right? But then crazy stuff happens after that. Oh, sorry about that. Let's, let's try that again. Okay. okay, so squid's gonna take the bait. Oh snap, the bigger squid went and got that. I don't know what was happening there. That was crazy because it literally caught the little squid as soon as it caught that thing. So it makes me think that the bigger squid was trying to go for the bait. Because if it were chasing the little squid, then the little squid wouldn't have stopped, right? I'm not completely sure what happens, but as you guys can see, cannibalism happens, and uh, it's not always raptorial feeding. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyways, back to this, Akras and eight arms. Everybody good with this? Okay, so tentacles, right? Who actually does have tentacles if not an octopus? Well, squid has two tentacles, but we can go to the other classes and find tentacles. Here we go. Look at a scallop. 
You see those tenant, those things? Those are tentacles, right? Those are true tentacles. And over here with the abalone I showed you guys before, those are true tentacles. Okay? So these two classes, can you guys name them? Can you guys name these classes? Which one? This one's bivalvia, right? Okay. And this one is gastropoda. Gastropoda. Right? Gastropoda. Not cephalopoda, right? That one's the octopus. Okay, so good. It turns out that all three classes of mollusks have, uh, have tentacles as well. So tentacles is kind of like a body part that they all have, but it's not one of the essential body parts because there's other organisms out there that have tentacles, right? For example, jellyfish, right? Jellyfish has tentacles and so does a sea anemone, but those are not mollusks. Those are, now that you guys know, cnidarians. Yeah, very good. Okay. All right, so this is another class of mollusks that we're not going to talk about the name because I just feel like it's going to get too complicated. It's going to be too many information for you guys, and it's not all that common. You know, these are usually found in the intertidal zone only, but they're called, the common name, which I think you guys should know, is called a chitin, all right? Chitins. It's a common, it's the common name of this group, all right? Don't worry about the actual phylum. The actual phylum is called polyplacophora, which means many plates, right? As you guys can see, it has eight plates. But you don't have to worry about that word, too many new words, right? But let's just check, is this actually a mollusk, right? You see a shell here made of calcium carbonate, but what would you need to do to ensure that this actually is a mollusk? You need to make sure it has... A what? A radula. A foot. And... And a uh, mantle, right? The three essential features. Okay, let's check. Let's flip one over. Over here, this is a gumboot crab, it's different from that one. But if you flipped it over, we could see that, yeah, it indeed has a radula, a foot, and a mantle on the outside. So it checks off the list, right? Now, it's not a member of a gastropoda, bivalvia, or cephalopoda, but based off this image, could you guys possibly figure out which one of those it's the closest related to? Why do you think that? I mean, they all have that, right? Yeah. But okay, I'll give you the um, you know the benefit of the fact that you're right. Okay, mm -hmm. it is closest related to gastropod because well, it looks the closest to a gastropod. If you guys remember that one snail clinging to the glass, eating with his radula, we showed the video on that one. Kind of looks like this, right? But it has the foot here and the radula right over. Okay, and then if it were to be a cephalopod, the foot would have to be arms, and the radula would have to be a beak in the middle of the arms, which is not the case right over here, right? Okay, this is just a normal algae scraping radula with a foot that comes onto a rock, just like a snail, right? So yeah, it is the closest related to gastropods, at least. Okay, so again, don't worry about the actual class, but just know it's a common name, okay? Kind. I still won't, if you guys actually see one, then you guys will know. It's a kind. Yeah, Tiffany? What's the difference? Oh, so the main difference is the, the type of shell that it makes. So a gastropod makes like a single shell that is just like one unit. That makes sense. It's like one continuous thing, right? The snail shell is just one spiral thing, or the limpet is one cone. But this thing makes a single shell that has eight plates on it. So it's got those plates, and those plates are not connected either, right? They're they're kind of connected, right? They're, they have like joints connecting each other, but they're not like fused, all right? So yeah, it's got like those eight plates. <clears throat> so would you say that it would like uh, look more like? You know how a roly-poly like has a little separate plate? Oh, I see, I see. Like, would it look like that? Um, you know, it can actually curl up like a roly-poly, but it's not closely related at all. So, we'll see today what phylum roly-polies are actually a part of, but in terms of the shell morphology, it's kind of similar. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's kind of similar, but not related, all right? But there's a lot of things that are similar and not related, such as like, a dolphin and a shark kind of have the similar body shape, but they're not related, right? Yeah, good observation. It's called a analogous feature. Right? Yes. Um, so how do you distinguish between the cephalopoda and the 
the cephalopoda and the gastropoda? Well, gastropoda is a snail and cephalopods like an octopus. So, I mean, personally, that's my best way of distinguishing the two. But if you want to get technical, you could say that the radula of a gastropod scrapes algae, whereas the radula of a cephalopod is a beak. And then cephalopods are usually big and have those arms and they're really highly mobile. And snails are slow. So that's another difference, right? And most cephalopods don't have a shell, right? They have either internal shell or no shell. Yeah, so those are just some of the things. Octopus is a lot smarter than a snail. <clears throat> okay. So let's continue on. Okay, so we're almost finished here. This is just a quick summary of what we got so far, but we have not talked about this last body part that is really, really important to a mollusk, but it's not one of the essential body parts because other things happen, right? So what I'm talking about is a siphon, and maybe you guys have heard of a siphon before. Not like as a body part, but as a piece of equipment, right? What does a siphon do? It sucks liquid. Yeah, okay, it sucks liquid out, right? So maybe you're talking about siphoning oil out of your car, right? Okay, so a siphon, what is it shaped like? It's a tube, right? That's exactly what a siphon is. It's a tube that is full of the liquid. Okay, it has to be full for it to work. If it's not full of the liquid, it's not going to work, right? So it has to be completely full, and then it makes liquid go from one side to another, right? That's what a siphon is, and in the case of these guys, they all have this tube that makes seawater go through it, okay? So why would you want seawater to go through their tube, right? Let's look at the siphons first. Here's an octopus siphon tube, right? Uh, the clam actually has two siphons, right? And then the, the snail, as you guys saw in that one video with the cone snail, the narrator actually mentioned siphon, right? But now we're talking about siphon. Thank you. Okay, two for the pond. And by the way, since we're here, we might as well name some of these body parts. What is, what is this called? An eye stock, yeah. What's that? A foot, yeah. And this? Mantle. Good. All right, what about that? This is I, yeah, okay, I was just testing you guys. Okay, so anyways, siphon, right? A siphon is a tube that has water going through it. Why would you need water through it? Through it? Let's look at the clam first, right? The clam makes the water go in through here, and if the water goes in through here, you see it goes right up past this structure. It's gills, okay? So it goes right up past these gills. Whenever water passes across the gills, the oxygen goes in the gills, so that's how it breathes. Right? So, sea animals breathe water, we breathe air, right? So, they need water to contact their gills like we need air to contact our lungs. And so, they bring water into their bodies to get the oxygen out of there. Alright, and as you guys can see from the clam, when it's done with it, it goes out the other side. Okay. But there's a difference between water, breathing water and breathing air, right? So, breathing air, it's usually just air plus maybe if you got some dust, you'll cough it up or something. But if it's water, seawater, for example, the water has oxygen, but seawater also has a lot of plankton in it, right? So if you're sucking all this water with plankton in it at the same time, why not just take the plankton out and eat it, right? It's, you can do two things at the same time, right? Eat and breathe at the same time. So if the clam manages to take the plankton out of the water before it gets rid of it, what do you think the feeding style of the clam is? Filter feeding, exactly, right. Whenever you're trying to take the plankton out of the water, it's filter feeding, right? If you're using a net, which they are using, right? It's usually their gills. Um, if they don't use a net, it's called suspension feeding. Right? Okay, so there you go. Clams are filter feeders, and if they're a filter feeder, then you guys see how they don't need a radula, right? Because they're not scraping off the rock. Right? They're not, uh, you know, crunching down on the crab. So, by filter feeding, they don't actually have or need or have a radula. Okay, so bivalve is the odd one out. They don't have a radula. So there we go. We got two uses for the siphon already, but there's even more, right? So siphon could be used for breathing. 
It could be used for filter feeding, but let's take a look at this animal right over here. Okay, so here's a tide pool, and in this tide pool we see an octopus, right? Okay, let's look at what this octopus is doing. Okay, see the water is getting sucked in through the mantle and out through the siphon. Okay, clearly it's just trying to breathe, right? But maybe you can, you know, extrapolate a little. What do you think it could do with that jet of water, right? Just think about it for a second. And then let me show you another cephalopod that is actually doing it for that purpose. Okay, so that octopus is just breathing, but considering the fact that it expels water like that, then let's check this out. Okay, here's a bunch of fishermen jigging for Humboldt squid. Okay, this giant three foot long squid, right? And let's see what the squid does when it's brought up to the surface. Where's the water coming out of again? It's side good, right? Okay. Uh, looks like you lost the fight and got that up, right? Okay, so what do you think, why do you think the, you know, the squid was trying to jet out that water as it was being caught? Yeah, probably a defense mechanism? Yes, it is kind of a defense mechanism, but in what way? Uh, that it's able to, like, disorient its target? Oh, interesting, so maybe you just squirt some water in their face. You know, um, they actually have a defense mechanism that ink, right? disorientates, yeah, um, ink, right? So this is just water. Right? So what could you do with a powerful stream of water? Yeah. Exactly. Well, backwards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So imagine like uh, it shoots water in this direction and its whole body will be shot in the other direction. Right? A little jet propulsion right over here. Right? So let's look, take a look at this picture of a squid. Here's its siphon. If it jets water out with high velocities out this direction, then going with Newton's third law, right? It goes that direction. Okay? So using the powerful jet of water through its siphon, it can actually shoot backward relatively quickly, right? And that's how squids swim around, okay? So another usage for the siphon, locomotion. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of like a cephalopod only thing, right? Octopus do this and Nautilus and cuttlefish do this, but the other two do not, right? The, the bivalve and the gastropod do not do this jet propulsion, right? So for a gastropod, they're probably just crawling around slowly, right? We know that snails crawl slowly. A bivalve is probably using its foot to either dig or hop around, right? And here we have cephalopods using their siphon to squirt water so they swim the other. Okay, so I'm going to show you one more novel form of locomotion that is found in a bike. Right? <clears throat> okay, so that's right here. So here's a scallop, and let's watch a scallop swimming, okay, and it's not using its foot, it's not using its siphon, or, um, yeah, it's not using its foot, right. Okay, so let's, let's try to figure out what its body part is using to swim around. Swimming scallop, right? Okay, so do you, you guys see its motion? It's opening its shell and closing it really fast. So, uh, what body part is it using? The muscle. Which muscle? Not the mantle. The yeah, the adductor muscle, right? Okay, so it's using its adductor muscle to swim around, right? So, here's just a novel form of locomotion that's not found in most of the other mollusks out there, right? I don't think any of the other bivalves do this at all, right? Not mussels or clams, only the skeletons. Okay, cool. All right, so we're finished with mollusks. Um, any questions on mollusca before we move on? Are we all good with mollusks? Yeah? Okay, cool. All right, so let's move on to 